Welcome back to the Arbitrage Run Show. I am your host, Donkey Teeth, at Z Diamond Hands, joined by Kevin from Arbitrage Racing. What's happening, Kevin? Hey, Donkey. Made it, man. Ten, tenth episode. We added a, added a zero. We did, yeah. Nobody thought we'd make it this far, but here we are. <laughs> hey, right, did you right. see that Zed added the uh, uh, XP points on the uh, the platform as a visual thing this uh, this week? I had not. I have you not didn't? Seen that. Oh, yeah. I, I just pulled pulled this uh, curveball on you here. Yeah, there's XP points on there. So just kind of a uh, – it seems like the class system and progression are getting very close. I like that. I guess they're not accumulating, right? It's just – No, yeah. They're just – it's kind of a visual thing. Uh, actually, I don't even know where it is. Somebody posted on um, – on Twitter and I saw people talking about it. So I like that. Yeah. It's, uh, exciting. It's exciting that it's getting close, but we have a, a, a long show planned. I don't want to say long. We have a lot that we want to get through. Um, we're going to kind of get back to a, a bunch of Twitter questions, but before we do that, um, we did tease this on last week's show, the historical pricing that we now have on arbitrage run. So before we get to diving into a bunch of Twitter questions, let me share my screen here and we'll take a look at the historical pricing and just kind of show show our viewers how you can use that. So if we go to any of these, build a breed, bid for a stud or bid for a female breed, we can see the, the last prices here that these uh, horses were sold for. So Ready, Set, Boom was sold twice uh, publicly for two ETH. Y2K, the, here's the last, there's been five Y2K sale prices and they've been going down each cycle. So the last sale was 0.6 for Y2K. This is the most recent one here, the first one that's showing after last price. Um, yeah, we see Festus was sold for 0.25. Pound of Fat was pretty steady there at 0.55. We sold Volatile Artist for 0.35. So you can play around with this. It's just to, to kind of give our users... Um, a little bit of a reference point. Our hope is to have a uh, very shortly have a standalone historical pricing page where you can go and sort by, you know, here's the cheapest horse that we have booked through the site um, and then sort by date and stuff like that. Because these prices, they are, uh, you can't read too much of the, without the context of when this was. Um, it's it's hard to take, take too much from it other than at, at one point over the last three months we sold one of these breeds for for this kind of price right kevin yeah it's interesting to see the fluctuations over time and i imagine as we get more and more into this you'll see it go up you'll see it go down but i think it's a nice addition it at least gives some kind of context rather than just firing blind hoping you get above the minimum yeah it's um it was one of the things that uh we got feedback on right away is that people just had no idea uh what to offer for these horses and you know they don't want to lowball us or be disrespectful or or you know spend time shopping in a, a range that, that they just is totally out of their their ballpark but it is it's a constantly moving target and we've talked about this on previous shows um we're guessing too at, at how to value these things a part of the equation is uh, the overall market and what uh, how many buyers there are supply and demand what everybody else is selling things for and then the other part of the equation is uh, opportunity cost for us, you know, what, what, what we think that we can make in terms of racing and breeding from that horse. And also I think a, a big part of the reason, probably the market as a whole, uh, valuations were higher, you know, two months ago is everybody was trying to build out their own bloodstock, uh, for their own breeding and their own building of their stable. So for us, we weren't super eager to let go of our, our, high-end premium pieces because we wanted to build a little bit more bloodstock to be able to breed down more exclusives and more elites and, and even crosses both for ourselves for conditional stuff and to offer that to the community at you know hopefully competitive prices so there's there's a lot of variables in here and you know i hope that people don't come through and, and see these prices and are like whoa that's expensive you know these guys are char charging outrageous prices uh because they're, they're a reflection of what the market was two months ago and again our goal of building out our own blood stock right yep exactly so i mean i think part of it they'll naturally go down until uh influx of demand comes right either it's new 
new players or new utility for certain types of horses. So it's just kind of natural economics for the most part. Yeah, I think there's two here that really pop out to me as as and I got one of them up on the screen right here, Verve at 1.2 ETH. And what happened there was we sold Verve's uh, female breed to Dan Shan for I think it was 0.5 Ethereum and he bred Verve with uh, Razor Glass and that popped out uh, Vigor Fire, just an absolute monster C1 paid racer. And so then we were very hesitant to sell Verve after that. And somebody came to us, I can't remember who it was off the top of my head, and they said, how much? And we're like, we're not really looking to sell. And they're like, how much? Give me a price. Mm-hmm. And we're like, I mean, I guess if you paid us 1.2, we you could twist our arm and we would do it. And they're like, done. And so it was that kind of thing. And same thing happened with Supreme Polarity because um, we had sold a couple of Supreme's breeds and we wanted it ourselves. And uh, Supreme Display of Talent basically did the same thing with Supreme and, and you know, gave us the godfather offer of 2.5 ETH for her breed. It's like, how can we pass on that? Uh, so it's it's th- that's what those prices are, right, Kevin? Yep, exactly. <clears throat> Supreme so. is still holding holding well, but we'll we'll see. Um, especially as a Genesis, we'll get a lot of data on that one. Yeah, we're, we're just yeah. It, the, the consistency of Supreme is uh, impressive, but she's also had uh, about the best partners in the game to breed with, right? Yep. So, um, yeah, throw us some some offers again. The, the market is definitely slow, and we've got a lot of ho- we're not we're trying to to scale back our operation because we've got we've got like a thousand horses now. It's a lot to manage. And we're waiting on direct lending to to start to get horses into other people's hands and not have to do, you know, this manual tracking and all that kind of stuff. So as of right now, we are kind of scaled back and there's a lot of horses that will go unbred that are, you know, I, I think probably should be bred uh, that, that have a place in somebody's stable. Uh, if you're looking towards the future and segmented racing and the new class system and progression and stuff like that. So we're happy to, to sell them. You know, we're selling some breeds at zero zero point five, and I mean, if you're a regular customer and you, you ask nicely, I mean, we'll hook you up with three three females for point zero five if we're not going to use them and they're just sitting around. Um, so yeah, throw some stuff out there. We're looking to to help people build their stables, but enough about that, Kevin. Let's dive in on some Twitter questions, huh? Sounds good. All right, so we got some good Twitter questions coming in this week. The first one we're going to go over here, Kevin, is coming from Zombie Racing. And this was an interesting one to us because, you know, there was a lot of drama around um, some recently unraced uh, Genesis Nakamoto's that were unwrapped and turned out to be really good racers. And so Zombie is kind of referring to that here in his question. He's saying, we've seen some good new Genesis Z1, Z2's unwrapped recently. Based on offspring data, do you look at offspring data to gauge parent ability? And how reliable do you think the data is? And is this definitely something that we've done, Kevin? We bought uh, ourselves double take based on um, offspring data. And I think that's a, that's a Z1 female that we bought and raced in the Lucky Maiden and ended up winning the Lucky Maiden with. And you could tell based on those offspring of double take that there was going to be some degree of distance preference. I mean, can you walk us through the, the thought process that we had there when we purchased double take? I was gonna say double take. You got to lead with like lucky maiden champion, right? It's like when you win a Super Bowl, you always get for the rest of your life Super Bowl champion. Um, but yeah, we had a. I'd say I mean not even that good of luck with double take. I would say it's probably maybe a seventieth percentile outcome of what we expected and what I think you get if you had a ton of of double takes out there. But I think it is super predictive using two point um, For better or for worse, it seems like what you're pulling in 2.0 is pretty much a direct reflection of the parents. And then you can kind of connect the dots, seeing what the offspring was, how good are they? And then comparing that to the raced partner in this case with, with double take, uh, she was unraced, but the partners oftentimes were raced. And we saw that basically the partners weren't as good as the offspring that they're producing with double take. Um, and on top of that, we were seeing some hints of, distance preference in this case on the marathon end that we weren't seeing in double takes partners. So there was reason to believe it wasn't a killer, right? Like we can talk a little later on perfection where you could pretty much tell perfection was going to be a beast marathoner. Double take was more of a price play. We thought there were, there were hints of uh, distance preference. And a lot of times it was out producing um, its partner in terms of the offspring produced. So we connected some dots there. 
Um, there's still a wide range of how good it could actually be. Like you don't know if the offspring, offspring produced was a hit or if it, it was just like a, a median outcome, but you take educated guesses in this. And for us, the price was right. I think we got it, I don't know, eight-ish as a Z1 unraced. Felt like I a good price. Nine. I think we paid nine. Nine? I want to say. Yeah. Um, and then we could immediately enter it into Lucky Maiden. We knew it had some distance preference and had a good a good shot at that. So for us, the ROI seemed solid. And it had some success breeding already. Uh, we knew we were going to have it with partners better than it was doing previously. Um, and I think we actually, oddly enough, bred it with perfection. Um, our first cycle, we had it and created that, that horse that first on the scene when all 10 of its discoveries, um, it was never going to be like a total freak, but it had a ton of consistency, uh, super left skewed graph, right? Like it's still never coming worse than, than eight, it's just outrageous. Um, so a lot of these double ups, is just printing um, some good distance preference as you would expect with those two. But that was our thought process on double take. And I think you're seeing that a lot more. That's really the, the edge with 2.0 breeding and how it translates to buying on race. Yeah, well, we actually just bought uh, the floor, the floor unraised Genesis Nakamoto like an hour ago for 4.5 on the same same type of thought. I mean, the upside, we feel like it's probably pretty capped on uh, on point is the horse's name. But there's got to be some sprint preference uh, here on this horse just based on if you dig on in on the offspring. And it's easier to look at the the offspring on on Haku, actually. I just you and I both I know have preference for know your horses, and it's actually uh spoiler, it's 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 uh working now. So I'm like eager to get back on know your horses, but it's actually easier to see um the offspring when you look over on Haku. But I'm already here, so we'll stay here. But you can see if you dig in on these on on point that there's gonna be some sprint preference. We'll be entering this one in in Lucky Maiden, and we got it for 4.5. So the price was was right on on, on point here too, right? Yeah, it's one of those, like, I feel very good. It's going to be at least 4.5. I'd be shocked if it's like a, a paid class one racer, but I think it's kind of like we have we have a few of those, like Buttery would be a good example where you can just inject some some distance preference and solid low Z Nakamoto base ability, potentially produce some of like the pound of fat types with it. Um, so if I were guessing, I bet it's probably going to be worth around six, seven as a kind of consistent class one free runner and some upside on the breeding side, but I'd be shocked if it's a, a paid racer. Yeah, and it's a good match for us with uh, Creation of Mortals, too. We got another sprinter to breed with him, uh, but you did bring up Perfection as well, and that was a horse that um, I would say it was no secret. There was probably, there was at least a half a dozen stables that were trying to buy Perfection before it was raced, and you could see based on the offspring that there was I think I don't remember what did you say you thought the floor was for perfection unraced because I we offered 30 ETH and I think we weren't the only ones that were in that think, ballpark unraced. Yeah. I mean, as a Z1, I'm pretty sure that was like like 20. It's always dependent at that level is dependent on the site and how the market's doing. But at that time, I think the floor was probably like delicious irony, like our Z1, um, which I mean is probably worth 30 by itself, uh, depending on the demand for Z1s at the time, but. That was the floor outcome. There was significant upside. I think it bred, uh, was it Mr. Scrappets was the one? Right. Where, I mean, that was the so. biggest slam dunk I've ever seen, where the parent on that is nothing special. Scrappets is, is a really good bred paid racer. Um, so you felt pretty good that perfection was going to be at least that good with upside of being like legitimately, I thought there was a chance it could have been like a grandeur type. Um, it's not quite that good, but it's still way up there. Yeah, well, Stoneflower actually, remember, was unraced and turned out to be very good as well. So, yeah, they, Champion Stables really hit the jackpot on those two, didn't they? Oh, Stoneflower was unraced? Wow. Yeah, how about that? Yeah, they raced Stoneflower. I mean, I, we can pull it up here. But, uh, yeah, so I guess to, to come back and answer the question, uh, let's see when that Griffin was. It was raced September 18th was the first race. Yeah, so they were both unraced. What a parry that was for Mr. Scrappets. Holy crap. Um, but yeah, you can do this for sure. And, you know, just to elaborate on it, because there was some drama out there about Queen Bean making these purchases and some accusations going around that we've got a uh, some foul play going around. Maybe um, Queen Bean had gotten the Aloha Tim playbook or, or the list of, of really good horses. But I think we can probably 
somewhat debunk that not fully debunk i suppose there's always a chance that something was going on but queen bean actually reached out to both you and i in a group chat this was back in the start of august and i know that queen bean reached out to bg too and bg shared uh, those messages asking for um offspring data and, and stuff like that so the the piece is kind of a line here but i'll pull up the message that queen bean showed to us and we actually talked to queen bean before deciding we would do this on the show uh, just to make sure it was okay with Queen Bean that we're sharing this. But here's the message that Queen Bean had sent to us. And essentially, what are the cliff notes here? I don't want to read this whole thing. People can kind of pause and read it if they want to. But what are the cliff notes of what Queen Bean was asking, the process here? Because Big Setup was the first horse. This was the first Genesis Nakamoto that Queen Bean had bought. It wasn't unraced. It had one Griffin race, and it actually had odds at, at 1,400, right? Yeah, yeah. Basically... It was a huge purchase for her. She hadn't done it yet, and she was scouting it out. And she or he. We don't know if Queen Bean is is a male or female. They, um, yeah, I'll say Bean. Bean didn't um, necessarily want to buy it without getting some more insights, uh, which I think is reasonable at this big of a purchase, the first one that they had made. And yeah, basically noticed it had it had odds. Uh, I think it was like in the threes at fourteen hundred. So that's always a good sign. Only that one race, and then noticed that. It was probably more of a mid or like a 14, 16 type um, by looking at the offspring. And to me, and the feedback I gave was basically, yeah, this is really good analysis. Um, with having odds that low, it either means you have super high base ability you know, in a weak field or you have a, a good U type horse um, because the U horses just never really get lower odds than that. And I think we looked at the offspring and then it looked like there were some variants passing down. There wasn't like an extreme distance preference passing. So we felt like there was really good upside at, I think it was like in the fives that she was paying um, or they were paying where it could be a really good mid with some natural variants. And having that um, as a Genesis, like Nakamoto, uh, it just seemed like a home run by a lot of upside and very little risk at that price. Yeah, and you can see here, here's what Big Setup ended up being. And again, when Queen Bean had sent us that message, it was there was one race and it was at 1400 and it had 3.85 odds. You could used to be able to kind of look at the, the field. You really couldn't tell that much from the other horses that were in it. Um, but uh, again, breaking down the offspring was was really where this, this play came in. And it's not like you know this horse is going to be really good. You, you kind of get a, a gauge for the spectrum, right? Like, the floor is going to be somewhere in this area and the ceiling is going to be somewhere in this area, right? Yeah, it's like, like when you're playing poker, right? Like you don't know the outcome. You're just trying to figure out the EVs there and like what is the order of the range of outcomes. And this one had a humongous EV. Um, and like it definitely hit an upside scenario, but I don't think it was like the absolute best case scenario. But Queen Bean did buy, uh, what's the, the name quite, uh, is it quite original? Mm -hmm. Quite original is, is probably the biggest success story that Queen Bean had with this this process, right? Yeah, and I don't I didn't do as much research on this one. She didn't reach out about this, uh, but yeah, that horse is incredible. Um, has some monster results. I think fourteen hundred, sixteen hundred. Yeah, and it's not to say that looking at the offspring again, uh, Queen Bean would have known that it was going to be this good, but. Uh, knew that it was a, a decent risk reward at the price that it was listed at. Um, so, yeah, I think that uh, a lot of people have, have kind of caught on to this. We know that Galactic took a lot of these uh, swings and had some swings and misses. And actually, Queen Bean uh, would be the first to tell you that that they had some swings and misses. I can't remember what the name of, uh, was it Coin Thrill? Coin Thrill was Something not very good, yeah. right? Uh, right. There were a couple. Because Queen Bean, after that first hit, of course, you're going to go back to the well <laughs> and keep doing it. Right. And uh, yeah, some of them were hit, some of them weren't. And that's kind yeah. of the nature of the beast. You got to heat check it. But of course, like, I don't know, one of the things that irks me the most about Zed Twitter is when they just like, you start pitchforks come out immediately without doing like your full research. Like there were some hits, there were some whiffs, uh, but they immediately go to kind of that Aloha Tim scenario. Um, because I mean, to their credit, a lot of people who did this the first time were correct. Uh, so they're kind of heat checking themselves on the conspiracy theories, but I, I don't think there's much to this one. Um, it, it seems legit. And it seems like she's kind of outworking a lot of people with these buys. Right. And it, this wasn't like crazy uh, in-depth analysis or anything. It was uh, just the uh, mostly, I believe, 
the average win rate of the offspring in 2.0 breeding, which is, uh, you know, if you get somebody that can pull that data from you, it's uh, something anybody could do, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's not that many, like, I think most of these were listed or something where that kind of got flagged in that department and then did more research based off of that. So um, I think it's very doable for a, a lot of the population, as long as they have yeah, the budget to buy a, a Z2 or Z1 neck. Right. Yeah, that's the bottleneck. Let's move on to the next question here, Kevin. We've got uh, a really fun question, actually, from Prodigy Stables asking, if you came into the game today, what five horses would you buy with an unlimited budget? I think there's a lot of different ways you could answer this question, of course. Um, do you want to go all in on the high end Genesis Nakamoto's? Do you want to spread it across the distance preferences? Do you want to hit different bloodlines to be hedged in that way? What are your thoughts here, Kevin? Yeah, I think, I mean, for me, I think I would take the, the, the easy route and just go with all the, uh, the proven Z1, low Z types, and then probably one exception, but so that's like ready, set, boom hit all the funnels, third head. I think there's some debate at, at sprint, whether you want to go like billions, who is probably the most valuable sprinter. That's not very, uh, not buried like Sentinel is. Um, and then you have like Tisha as well, who probably has had more breeding success. I don't think probably, I think definitely more breeding success than billions, but um, just very different types. So I would actually probably go Tisha um, just to be a little different. That's probably a little against the grain. Um, and then Breathless Edge, I think, is the classic, classic horse um, in the in the distance funnel. You could also make a case you may want to get some um, some mares in there because I think these are all stallions at this point. But at the same time, with this caliber of a horse, you're gonna have people willing to do swaps with you. So I don't think it's that big of a deal. Um, and then my last, my fifth would be something a little different. Um, and I would probably say Fairy Dancer. Um, some people may not even know who Fairy Dancer is. It's a horse I had a crush on for basically a year now. Um, obviously, it's I think it got bought by Tim. Now it's burned or in some lot that will never, never be raced again. But do some research on that horse. It is legitimately almost like ready, set, boom level. But it's a, it's a Buterin Z8 or Z9. And it's a super rare. Uh, Gainsborough, which is probably my favorite color of, of the horses. Um, so you basically have a race at boom level racer as a Genesis thinking about the game segmenting. Um, and as a Buterin, you mean? A Buterin, yeah, sorry. Buterin only races probably coming. They've already had some tournaments like that. You got to think that only grows. That horse is far and away the best Buterin marathoner. Um, happy, happy joys up there, but it can't hold a candle to a fairy dancer. So I would probably go against the grain and, and pick that. Uh, if you're going more traditional, um, I don't want to take all yours, but there's a, a Z2 mare I would take that I think's on your list that would would be the replacement for Fairy Dancer if you didn't want to go Buterin. But in terms of racing against peers, that horse is as much of a unicorn as any horse in the game. Right, yeah, I figured it out is the the one you're referring to. We had the, the first three the same, third head, ready, set, boom, and breathless edge they seem like no-brainers to me and i thought figured it out was kind of a no-brainer too um because then you can pair it with uh ready set boom and, and breathless edge and kind of alternate and just build out some ridiculous bloodlines um you know there's an argument for i think the fifth spot for for me is kind of up for grabs you mentioned um tisha but secret strategy deserves uh a shout out for that spot um and if you're talking about fairy dancer, I don't know how we don't put Sentinel in the in the mix then, because I mean, if Sentinel was was around, wouldn't Sentinel be a no brainer top five? Um, you don't know how it breeds, but yeah, I mean, probably. Right? It, I'm sure it could pop some stuff out in 2.0. Yeah, Billions was the one that I had uh, penciled in there, but along with your your thoughts on fairy dancer i mean ducky could could uh, be in the mix there and you kind of get a little bit more exposure to that uh, variance type horse because you've got a lot of consistency there with your third head ready set boom breathless edge figured it out uh billion so maybe you want a little bit more variance exposure uh ducky is interesting and then i mean i think that there could be an argument to mix in one of those 2.0 legendaries like a dank phantom 
um, or even the 1.0 because that variance is is so rare with a Y2K and Evergreen Gates and Diamonds. But um, yeah, I, I think the safe play is to stick with the the Genesis Nakamoto's. Uh, that they're gonna they're gonna bring value to Genesis in in this class update. I, I'm so confident in that. And Facundo talked about it. in every facet of the game that they build out is gonna be there's gonna be preferential treatment to Genesis as there should be. Um, they're they're very rare assets. So I think you just go right to the top. If 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 uh, if money is not an object, which you know, there's very few people that that have that luxury. But um, you know, Ted Racing seems to. Uh, we should talk about Ted Racing here before we jump onto the next. Uh, he's he's coming in and uh, making some splashes, huh? Yeah, I wish Ted Racing would find his way onto onto Arbitrage Run. Um, haven't interacted with him yet, but yeah, he's been making some big purchases, really in those really strong blood 2.0 breeds. It seems like so. I don't know who they are, where they came from, but. They're hooked, and I mean, having a good strategy. I haven't looked at all the prices they've been paying. I know it's um, some have been high, but some have been some solid deals as well. So I'm interested to, to learn more about this character. Yeah, hopefully Ted Racing is a fan of uh, the Arbitrage Run show. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I don't think anybody knows who Ted Racing is. You love these mysteries when it happens. We had it when when uh, Wagme came in and started uh, yeah. making waves and buying purchases. That was the and, other conspiracy with uh, Ted Racing was that they knew Queen Bean and they were like the same person or, <laughs> or connected. That was the next layer to that conspiracy people were throwing around. So always entertaining on Zed Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what was the, the last question that we wanted to hit on today, Kevin? Was it the so Chakra? There were a couple we're going to hit on next week. There was one, um, I think, Chakraba, however we say that name. Chakrabra. Um, Chakrabra. Um, talking about Finneys and Buterans. Yeah. Yeah. So here's that question right here. You mentioned before, as the game grows, more players are onboarded. The majority of horses will be Finney and Buterin because of lower cost to, breed, to buy and breed. As the game segments, could top tier Finneys and Buterin Genesis horses value rise to and... Uh, with levels of Genesis Nakamoto's or potentially above. Um, well, yeah, I mean, we already have uh, the number of Finneys and, and Buterans is already uh, exponentially growing uh, past Nakamoto's and, and Sabo's even. Um, so your thoughts here on this, Kevin? Um, I don't, it's, it's tough to tell, right? And none of this is financial advice as always, but it really depends on the value that Zed provides. I think in a functioning economy, you're never going to have buterin only tournaments exceed the pots of like a Nakamoto only tournament or um, or an open class tournament. So in that aspect, if there's more buterins and and less price pool, they shouldn't be worth more than like the top flight um, Nakamotos. I, I do think there's a, a buying opportunity in the fact that they're just not going to be priced the same way. So there could be like a buterin relative to its peers that is going to absolutely dominate these lower pot tournaments and they're priced like they were a Nakamoto having a race against Nakamoto's at that level. So I think there's a buying opportunity in there. Um, but unless Zed juices the prize pools of these to be equal or greater than Nakamoto only tournaments or Zabo only tournaments, I don't see it happening. Yeah, I agree. I mean, th I think there's opportunity, but I don't see them ever reaching at least in the genesis department um reaching equal value to you know the high end genesis now of course the best of the best buterin and, and finnies uh absolutely should be worth more than the worst of the worst or even the mid-range nakamoto's and sabos right oh yeah i mean like like i just quoted fairy dancer right like that right. horse if it were on the market now we and we'd probably pay i don't know 20 to 30 for it just because it's it's that good and it's a beauty. I don't, I don't really care because it's going to dominate these open races as well. And then when they it does have these smaller, more segmented pots, it's going to have an even bigger advantage there. So there are exceptions. I think Moolah was the same way for a while um, before variants got nerfed a little bit, but yeah, I think there's still extreme value there, but I would take the third head ready set boom over those anytime. Yeah, agree. Uh, the other question I was going to hit on real quick because we did tease the my idea for uh, the Zed Rainmakers, and we'll circle back on that next week. We'll kick that out as a teaser for next week, and there's going to be a couple other questions here. Uh, Sunny Days, we'll hit your question next week. We're just going to kind of roll some of these over because there was a lot of great questions this week. I think Sunny um, and Smiley had a very similar one too. Yeah. 
Yeah, and Dan uh, wanted uh, us to talk. He said all of his questions. I don't know that he wanted us to talk about it, but he said all of his questions are six gate versus 12 gate. I mean, it is yeah. really interesting where we're at with these six. And I like that people are calling it six gate versus 12 gate because six horse, uh, it kind of ends up being confusing when you keep I saying like the gate as well. Yeah, and and maybe we gate. could have different animals racing at some point, right? So <laughs> another <laughs> another to, to see in the future. But yeah, ro I mean, robot horses. And that could be it. Just as long as they can run in the gate, we're good. But I, I agree. Like, we just need to make a show out of six versus 12. There's all these questions. We can bucket them together. Uh, yeah. And, we'll and then we'll talk them. about robot horses and uh, Rainmakers Z yeah. as well on next Two hour show. special. <laughs> uh, but this was the one that I wanted to hit on here from Lobofish talking about how uh, DraftKings allows people to buy and sell and enter con contests on Rainmakers without signing on MetaMask, why can't Zed implement this and save us all a bunch of time? So I, I'm not a blockchain expert. Uh, I would never present myself uh, as that. But if you signed up for Zed using an email account back in the day, or and I've, I haven't done the social media either, but I, I think essentially that is very similar to what DraftKings is doing. You don't have custody of the NFT. So DraftKings, I, I've referred to it as a, a bastardization of NFTs. Um, they've got like I own I own a Romeo Dubs Elite uh, in my personal DraftKings, and you and I and Keith, we started a DraftKings Rainmakers kind of team, and we pulled together for it. And I've I've wanted to send my Romeo Dubs over so we can use it. And it's not letting me. So I, I I don't actually own this NFT. I can't send it to my wallet. I'm not sure what their rules and regulations are on sending. Like it's supposed to be 21 days you hold it and then you can send it, which is, you know, this is the thing with centralization. It's a double-edged sword. Um, you've got recourse if you lose all your stuff, if they lose it, uh, theoretically, but you kind of got to play by their rules. We can't send that stuff. Uh, at least with Zed's email account, you could send it to your uh, personal MetaMask or a ledger or, or something like that. But that's essentially what's going on here with DraftKings Rainmakers, as, as far as I can tell, and what happens if you sign up with a social account or an email account on Zed. You're using one of Zed's wallets, and they're kind of giving you that address to use, but they have your they have your NFTs. So um, it's, it's a weird thing in the crypto world. The, the crypto fanatics are... I'm sure not a fan of that type of centralization and control that uh, a company has over you know, your token, your digital asset. So does that kind of make sense, Kevin, from our simplistic kind of point of view on, on crypto and NFTs? Yeah, I think I know even less than you, so I'm not going to pretend to have an educated response here. But it, yeah, it is a little frustrating with like how easy it seems in a lot of ways on DraftKings. Um, and there are Fortune 500 companies that they, they've done it for a long time, but they did kind of jump into this pseudo crypto space and nail it with rainmakers, at least in my opinion. But I think a lot of what they're doing, they can get around that, that Zed really can't right now with MetaMask or, or the ownership. So it's a good vision. I just, I don't know how close that is to actually making it that seamless. Well, I think with direct lending, it kind of becomes more possible. And, and I've talked about this before. It's like, like I want to be able to have our all of our horses on a ledger uh, where they're secure and then lend them out to one of our other stables so we can run from there, but we don't have to worry about getting hacked or somebody transferring them out because uh, you have to actually sign with the ledger. So um, I think that it is is kind of close. I, I appreciate that Zed gives us th this kind of flexibility. For a long time, you couldn't use a ledger with Zed. Uh, and that was one of the things when I first came in, when it's like, oh, I'm going to buy a, you know, ten, fifteen thousand dollar horse and have it sitting here on this hot wallet where I can click a link and suddenly poof, it's gone. Uh, I should be able to put it on a ledger and, and secure it. And you should be able to lend that out to another one of your wallets. So or, or just go in and set, you know, like the parameters like, OK, this wallet has the, the permission to race and breed this horse, mm -hmm. but can't transfer it. Um, that stuff, of course, it sounds easy to say, like all of our ideas. I don't know how difficult it is to program that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, I think essentially if you've got an email wallet, you don't have to sign. You just click and it signs and you don't have to go through the whole MetaMask, you know, three clicks. And it does save you some time. But um, let's move on here, Kevin, to the, the last thing we we're going to hit on because we did want to talk about one successful breed. We've done a lot of keeping it real the past few weeks. So we'll just talk about this one successful breed which was um, third, what was the name? Third something. 
it was find it. Third force. Third force, right? It's pearly force and real supreme head. Oh, you know what? We didn't spin the wheel either. We gotta spin the wheel. Let's spin the wheel first. There we go. Let's spin that wheel. Can you see that there, Kevin? Yep, looking good. All right, we got Triumph for Hours back for another week on the wheel, and we're washing it clean and adding three new exciting horses. Granger Plan, we actually just traded with Rentham Racing uh, probably a, a week ago or so. We traded Real Supreme Head and a little bit of Ethereum <clears throat> for Granger Plan. So we got Granger Plan we're going to put on there. Awesome marathoner. Supreme Boom, uh, that's the son of Supreme Polarity and Ready, Set, Boom. And then Butterball. A really good sprinter. So, which one of these you still are you still looking for Triumph for hours out of this group? Yeah, I'm still Team Triumph. If we're talking about like ownership and you could breed and stuff, it'd be a little different. But yeah, renting for racing, Triumph. Yeah, that's my that's my favorite horse. All right, here we go. Butterball. Butterball. Butterball's a fun one. The only sprinter on the list. Uh, one of the best exclusive from post update wouldn't you say yeah i think so i mean it's it's still probably in my eyes a, a definitely a top 10 sprinter in 2.0 i could argue top five as well it's one of those that can race paid and as always will go 50 50 if you choose to go um choose to race paid but it also has some good consistency where it can qualify for these tournaments so um i'll put that in filming this on on friday october 7th i'll put that in uh tonight at 11 p.m. Eastern, so October 7th, 11 p.m. Eastern, uh, we'll we'll put him in the in the lending, and hopefully you have a good four days. Butterball, that is, and just a reminder: you can go to Butterball. Is Butterball? I think is in Arbitrage Main Stable, right? Yep. You can pull up that stable, and you can well, you can pull up Butterball's page and see if Butterball's been lent out, or you can go to the the lending on there. You can also go on Z Lead. And it'll show if Butterball has been claimed out of the Lending Barn. Uh, last week, the publisher sat around for, I want to say it was like 90 minutes or something like that after you put the publisher in. So uh, there's a lot of horses in the Lending Pool. You can keep refreshing and refreshing and <laughs> never see these horses. So if you got the time and you want to and you see that they're, they're not lent out, uh, go for it. All right, real quick. We're at 38 minutes, but let's hit on this horse. Uh, third force. So third force was a horse that we bred uh, and it was right around the time that we made that trade of real Supreme head for Granger plan and Rentham kind of worked with us and Plotten and Trotten here to, to make good on this breeding deal. So the fee here for real Supreme heads rental was 0 0.5 Ethereum. And again, this is a legendary coming from third head and uh, Supreme polarity and Plotten and Trotting bred real supreme head with pearly force his exclusive really nice mid and he was looking to to breed a 1600 1800 beast and it so far you know it, it hasn't hit that c1 wall yet it's going to be really interesting i don't know how far you've dug in on this horse kevin if you've got any speculation on how it's going to respond to class one because it's it's been tearing up class two so far and you can see there's some variance in here what are your thoughts uh, about what happens when it does get to class one yeah, I think, I mean, it, it seems to have a good amount of variance. I'd say like the the tail that goes all the way to the right where you can feel optimistic. It'll have some chances at winning on the other end, even in tough fields. Uh, but it also has some good like stacking to the left, which is going to mean it, it should flame quite a bit too. And it'll be good for these free tournaments. So I, I think it'll have a good chance at flaming in like the lower dollar class ones. I'd be a little surprised if it could flame above that. Um, and it should, it should flame in every single free race it runs in just due to that, that strong base ability and, uh, and that left skew on this graph. So it's definitely torn through, through class two. And most of these class two page are almost as hard as some of the, the easiest um, class one page, especially with the six horse. So I'm optimistic. It can make the jump, not totally hit the wall, but I don't think it's, a class one killer, but you don't need it to be. Um, and if we're talking like valuation, I know they have it listed as kind of the, if you take this, take it away, Ted price. But um, for me, I think it's probably worth around 1.5 to two, uh, maybe a little more if you 
think about breeding it and it being a filly, but personally I'd be in that range. And it's an elite too. So you've got that, that segmented elite potential and you can breed it out into the cross level, which, you know, we've been a fan of doing, it's already got some nice profit. Um, Kevin, if you're, um, if you were a seller, is that the price that you would sell at around two? Uh, no, that's probably the buy price. I'd sell around three, I think. Um, so yeah, I, I would definitely take five. Well, congrats uh, to Plotman and Trotting. This is a very successful breed, especially in the current environment. It's really not easy to get competitive paid racers. You know, the, the, the hit rate is very low right now, but we've got this new class system coming. Hopefully, hopefully it changes everything. Anything else you want to add here before we wrap it up, Kevin? No, I think I'm good. All right. Well, we will answer uh, some of the uh, next week's show. We'll just make it the, the six horse versus 12 horse. And if we end up with some extra time, we'll talk about the um, crazy Zed Rainmakers idea, robot horses, all that fun stuff. Uh, but until then, let's wrap it up here, Kevin. Follow Kevin out there on Twitter at Arbitrage Racing. I'm at Zed Diamond Hands. Find us uh, over on our website, uh, arbitrage.run. You can play around on there, look through some historical pricing now. Uh, we're going to be launching an update to the distance preferences, so they sort a little bit easier for you. Some of the, A lot of the horses are being misclassified as like mids or, or marathoners just because of uh, the formula that's in there right now. And if you could subscribe to our YouTube show, that'd be great. Hit the like button, and we'll catch you guys next week. Take care, Kevin. See you.